Theresa May insisted a deal is within our grasp. This after a new draft document was published outlining what the UK's relationship with the EU will look like after Brexit. Downing Street appeared to be taken by surprise when the 26-page political declaration on trade, security and other issues was leaked out this morning. The Prime Minister then tried to sell the deal in the House of Commons but struggled to convince Conservative MPs whose support she desperately needs to get it through Parliament. Here's our political editor, Gary Gibbon. Well, we've been telling you to expect the Prime Minister on our sofa and we're going to have to disappoint. Suddenly, the Prime Minister's plans had to change. In Brussels, EU ambassadors were given the political declaration. In a way, our job is done. <laughs> As of 10.45 today... Leaks meant a milestone moment was being tweeted out. The Prime Minister had to step in and shape the coverage. And after the Cabinet were hurriedly briefed in a telephone conference call, number 10 announced there would be a statement to MPs and before that, these words in Downing Street. The British people want this to be settled. They want a good deal that sets us on course for a brighter future. That deal is within our grasp and I am determined to deliver it. The EU has inserted a series of phrases at the government's request, which it's clearly hoped will help Theresa May sell the deal to MPs. The declaration speaks of both sides' determination to replace the backstop somehow so it doesn't come into use. It says various technologies will be considered as one way of avoiding the backstop. It talks of the UK having an independent trade policy and underlines Brexit eventually means the end of free movement and possible visa requirements for long-term EU visitors. Her critics were more interested in the withdrawal agreement and the backstop that's in it. There is a danger that should talks fail, the backstop becomes accepted. We have the horror of being in the customs union, the horror of Northern Ireland being split off under a different regime. We should junk forthwith the backstop upon which the future economic partnership, according to this yes. political declaration, is to be based and which makes a complete nonsense of Brexit. Nonsense. This, and I'd like the Prime Minister to confirm it, is not in any way legally binding. This is, this is a draft <laughs> treaty. The Labour leader said it was thin stuff Labour's and largely waffle. Test. This Half-baked deal is a product of two years of botched negotiations in which the Prime Minister's red lines have been torn up, Cabinet resignations have been racked up and checkers has been chucked. This is a vague menu of options, not a plan for the future and not capable of bringing our country together. I have to say to him that on virtually everything he said in his response to my statement, he couldn't be more wrong. Yeah. Indeed, I didn't believe that he'd actually even read the political declaration that we've published today, like the withdrawal agreement. An even harder sell to Mrs May's Brexiteer hardliners were the declaration words hoping to build and improve on the single customs territory plans. The declaration says that the UK will consider aligning with EU rules on medicines, chemicals, plants and aerospace, a list many expect to increase. And that the EU and the UK aspire to a trading relationship on goods that is as close as possible, not the pure frictionless trade the Prime Minister wanted to have written in the deal. There is a spectrum that there is a balance between commitments that are given on rules and the issue of the checks that take place at the border. And it remains, it remains our, our uh, intention as a government to work towards that frictionless trade. That sliding scale of rule-taking in return for access to EU markets is why he resigned. The top reason people voted to leave the EU was to take back democratic o uh, control over our laws. Isn't it the regrettable but inescapable reality that this deal gives even more away? Prime Minister. Resign, one Labour MP joked. She clearly you, hadn't spoken to him to in the busy week since he'd done just that. Friend. And I think this is the first opportunity I had to be able to thank him for the work that he did as Brexit Secretary. Theresa May couldn't emphasise enough she'd fought off an EU attempt to tie down access to British fishing waters. We have firmly rejected, we have firmly rejected 
We have firmly rejected a link between access to our waters and access to markets. The fisheries agreement is not something we will be trading off against any other priorities. The EU senior negotiator quickly tweeted a cheeky riposte suggesting access to waters and market access had been linked. Not in the language the EU wanted, ministers said. We asked two think tanks what the declaration really tells us. And I think the EU has evidently moved and does want to find a way of making this work for both sides. So there could be a compromise, even though the EU often told us it's either Norway or but it, Look, this is obviously a bespoke relationship and the EU wants to find a way that the UK can actually make this work. And there are parts of this, of this political declaration which show that they have taken on board some of the UK's suggestions, some of the UK's asks, and, um, but of course it will, it will depend on whether they can make it work. And, and whether they really want to. You used to work in the Commission. Do they write this sort of stuff sometimes yeah. and then the go out the room and cross their fingers? I mean, it is aspirational, yeah. So, um, you know, they could, it could be sort of good, you know, good intent new and, and, and new music and, and actually when it comes to negotiating uh, it might be more difficult. The British people want Brexit to be settled. They want a good deal that sets us on a course for a brighter future. And they want us to come together as a country and to move on, to focus on the big issues at home, like our NHS. The deal that will enable us to do this is now within our grasp. In these crucial 72 hours ahead, I will do everything possible to deliver it for the British people, and I commend this statement to the House. Many thought that was Theresa May's strongest argument of the day. The people want this Thank over you, with. The Chancellor of Austria, currently chairing the EU, called in to check on progress, and then, unusually for a national leader, chatted to the chief whip too. A shrewd move, given the reception the declaration got in the Commons today. Well, as you were hearing there, this is a very different document from the draft treaty, the withdrawal agreement. There's lots of aspirational language, lots of caveats, lots of adjectives. Everything is deep, broad and ambitious. And it is a, it is a very different document. What Theresa May has got here, though, is the sort of direction of travel that she wants to take policy in. I'm not sure it's where she always wanted to take policy, but where she wants to take the future relationship, that is in here. The Chequers isn't in, in here exactly what she was talking about in the summer, but the idea that we get more closely aligned with Europe in our regulations, uh, maybe take some of their rules in return for uh, freer access, uh, closer to frictionless access for trade, that is in here. So uh, she probably uh, feels that she's, she's got something here. But, but there is still absolute resistance in the, in the House of Commons from Conservatives, from the DUP. Uh, they've got Boris Johnson coming to their uh, rally uh, this weekend, their conference. Nothing seems to have shifted there. We are two weeks away, probably, from the critical vote on this. A week is a long time uh, in politics, but there aren't many weeks these days that seem to run in her direction. Now, to thrash this all out, we have the government, the opposition and a former EU commissioner. First, to Justice Minister Rory Stewart, MP. Now, the lodestar to the negotiations, at least from a British point of view, was Chequers. Chequers isn't in this. It doesn't explicitly refer to Chequers, but it has the no same... No frictionless trade. It has the same basic principle. And I think in the end, of course, there are compromises and negotiations, so it's not going to be exactly like Chequers. But the big fact is... There's agreement on control of free movement of people, so over immigration, but there's a loss of the advantages of single market access. And that is an achievement because that's something that Europe probably a year ago would have said we couldn't have. They would have described that as cherry picking. But we have talked all the time about frictionless trade and that isn't in it. What it defines is this, that the closer the regulations are, the closer the trade. And there's a phrase that reflects that, that if we deviate a great deal from the European Union, then checks would come in on borders. But that's to do with a very honest balance. The more ambitious we want to be about diverging from the EU, the more realistic we would have to be about what that would mean. For well, now, the European EU. Court of Justice, so hated by the Brexiteers, uh, will still dictate. I mean, basically, there's going to be an arbitration panel for difficult things. And whenever EU law comes into play, who will look at it? The ECJ. So on, on the ECJ, that's only in relation to EU law just as in relation to British law, the British courts would hold. So it is taking away the ECJ jurisdiction over British law, but it's a concession that over EU law... I'm afraid law I haven't spotted the Brit phrase British courts. Well, it's very clear that the ECJ refers only to EU law, not to British law.
And that's important because it's, it's right and proper that the ECJ should have a say over EU law. But the point is we're leaving the European Court of Justice when it comes to domestic legislation. You would say there's not a parity of respect. If you're going to mention the EU Court of Justice, then perhaps you ought to mention so, British justice. So, so, John, I mean, I think there are many things that you and I can find in this document uh, to pick over. But I think the big shift is that it is a much, much friendlier, warmer document from the EU than you perhaps would have expected six months ago. And in some ways, what's really significant is what's not in the document. So they're not saying you can only have Canada or Norway. They're not repudiating a close relationship. In fact, the entire document seems to suggest that people who said the EU was setting out to somehow punish Britain were wrong. This represents a turn in the relationship where genuinely it seems that both sides want to get to a warmer relationship. And that is a huge progress in terms of the next two years of negotiation. Well, of course, you were somebody who voted Remain. <clears throat> and the fact is that the the loudest noise today has come from the Brexiteers, who say this is totally unacceptable. From my point of view, this has to be a deal that brings as many people in the country as possible together. It can't be a hard Brexit deal, and it certainly can't be a second referendum deal. It has to be something that acknowledges the Brexit referendum happened, gives control over borders, but at the same time acknowledges people who voted for Remain are worried about the economy, they want a close relationship with Europe. This is a document which lays out all the way from human rights to foreign and political cooperation, that we want to be Europe's closest partners in the world. And I think that's right, because we have to heal the country. But we do have to sort of accept that if they're going to be as loud as this when it comes to voting, they're going to be voting no, and they're going to reject it, and then where are we? Have to make the argument again and again, and the argument has to be... Do you think you'll persuade be... them? Did well, you see the faces of Ian Duncan Smith, Jacob Rees-Mogg? I could list them all. So. Clearly, I'm not going to be able to persuade everybody, but in the end, this can only be done if the public accepts two basic principles, that we're not going to have a second referendum and simply pretend the first referendum didn't happen, on the one hand, and we're not going to go for a no-plan, no-deal Brexit. Once you've accepted that, you end up somewhere in this territory, and the political agreement for my money is a very good, warm statement by the UK and the EU of where that That's interesting, because be. the other day, Mrs. Mrs May said the choice was my deal, no deal, or remain in the European Union. You're saying she was wrong. You can't remain in the European Union. So I'm saying that once you've accepted that you don't want to have <clears throat> remain in the European Union, once you've accepted you don't want to have no deal, no plan Brexit, you end up here. I mean, if we had more time, I could suggest why I think it would be very dangerous and politically polarizing to try to have a second referendum. But I think if you accept as almost all MPs do, mm. that they don't want a second referendum, they don't want a hard Brexit, then it's this. And I think what's interesting here is that this is France, Germany and the EU making a much better goodwill effort than you would have thought they would have done six months ago. Uh, OK, hand on heart, what you've read today, do you really believe that it is better than what we have at the moment? In one very important respect, it respects the result of the referendum, and that's where you and I might disagree. So I'm not arguing that it's going to be a huge economic improvement necessarily, but it respects the result of the referendum, gives us control over immigration, it shows that vote happened, and politically, that is so much more important and is a huge improvement on trying to pretend that referendum didn't happen. Rory Stewart, thank you very much indeed for talking thank to you. us. Well, I'm joined now by the Shadow Brexit Secretary, Sir Keir Starmer. Keir Starmer, is there anything, anything in the realm of reality that would make you and your party vote for this deal? Well, the deal presented to us this afternoon is so vague, just sort of listing the options, that we couldn't possibly vote for it. Now, that's not a new criticism. We said months ago to the Prime Minister, when it comes to the future relationship, we know it won't be legally binding, but we do need detail and precision. We need right. to know where we're heading and don't come back with something which is vague. Right. She's done precisely that, and it's impossible to back something as vague as this. Well, if you're going to vote that way, if you're going to vote the deal down, uh, and we know how, you know, some of the Brexiteers are going to vote and the DUP. It's a no deal, then. No, I don't accept. But that's the that inevitable what, conclusion of that what, vote in Parliament. If what, you vote against it, there will not be a deal. I do Finished. not. I, I've been saying for weeks and for months that the majority in Parliament does not accept this false choice between a bad deal and even worse. And I've said for a long time that the majority 
will not give authority to the Prime Minister to proceed to no deal. Now, yesterday, Amber Rudd said precisely the same thing as me from her position within the Cabinet. We will have to make a diff oh. difficult decision um, when and if the deal is voted down. But simply to proceed to no deal would be reckless. Right. And I don't think that I don't think this Prime Minister wants to do that, and she certainly won't have authority to do that. But that's precisely what you're going to do. You are going to be reckless with the state of the country's economy because when you vote against this deal, the pound will probably crash, the stock market might hit the floor. And these but are the listen, risks that what, you're running. What would be reckless is to simply sign up to a bad deal. Um, because the Prime Minister's run down the clock. And if I was coming on your programme to say it's, it, it's inadequate in all these respects, it isn't good for the country, it's not going to safeguard manufacturing, but guess what? Labour's going to vote for it. You would be challenging me uphill and down Dale. It is not reckless to say it's not right okay. for the country to vote for a bad deal. But the only way you would, you would get the outcome that you want is if you were in power. The only way that would happen if, is that there well, was a general election. Hang on a minute. And the only way you can get a general election is if there's a vote of no confidence that you win. So why don't you go to that vote of no confidence now? Well, because we haven't yet had the vote on the deal. Um, and we need to have that vote on the deal. What we've been saying to the Prime Minister for a long time is there is a majority in Parliament uh, for a comprehensive customs union um, and for a single market deal. The Prime Minister is praised for a sort of resilience, but what she's really doing is ploughing on without listening what's being said to her from both sides of the House. And what you can't do now is to say, well, I've run the clock down, this has got the word deal at the top and signatures at the bottom, so you're going to have to vote for it. Jeremy Corbyn recently told Der Spiegel, the German magazine, that Brexit cannot be stopped. Brexit cannot be stopped. Do you agree with him? I think he said we can't stop Brexit. But what I've been clear about is that Brexit can um, be stopped. But the question we're facing at the moment is not that question, but a different question, which is, is this deal good enough? And the answer to that is no from the opposition. And it looks like it's no from quite big chunks of the Tory party. Right. So to be clear, if there was, if there was a people's vote, a second referendum, would you vote Remain? Yes, I voted Remain last time, and I would vote Remain again if that was not. How would Jeremy next Corbyn time. vote? Well, you'd have to ask Jeremy about that. I think in the past he has said he'd vote Remain, but you'll have to ask Jeremy about that. Wouldn't it be good to get a little bit of clarity on how the party leader would vote on this? Well, what we did at party conference was try to map out the decisions in the order that we're going to mm. have to take them. First decision is on the deal. What are we going to do? And we said we'll apply the test that we've had in place for 18 right. months. If the deal goes down, we then answer the next question, what will you do next? We said we'll call for a general okay. election. So clarity there. If we press on, if there is no general election, uh, all options on the table, including a public vote. Now, that's okay. what Jeremy signed up to. It's what I'm signed up to. The whole Labour Party is signed up to. And actually, there's huge support okay. for it across the, across the party and right. across the trade okay. union movement. Well, join me now from Brussels is the former EU Trade Commissioner and former Director General of the World Trade Organization, Pascal Lamy. Pascal Lamy, wonderful to have you on the programme. You've had both jobs, so you're in a unique position to kind of judge both scenarios. So when Theresa May says that she, you know, Britain can be a de facto member of a customs union in a transitional phase, but at the same time stitch together an independent trade policies with outside partners, is she telling the truth? Well, I think the truth is that uh, if you are a member of a customs union, uh, which is about goods, not services, although there may be questions about that, the reality is that you are bound by the group to which you belong within the customs union for what the external policy of this customs union. Customs union means you have the same customs around the Union. And what is on the table is a sort of deal where uh, UK exits as much as possible yeah. politically and as little as possible economically. And this customs union issue, as we all know, stems from the problem that right. you, don't, you cannot have a border uh, between uh, <coughs> Northern and Southern Ireland. So but while... that's the custom union has to do with Ireland. OK, but while we're in this twilight zone of trade, are we in a position to cobble together independent trade deals with other countries? Is that allowed? For goods. 
For goods. I, I, I'll, I'll give you my answer, frank answer. For goods, the answer is no. For services, the answer is maybe. But this is precisely what she has promised to her party and to Parliament and to the country. It is one of the key pillars of her sales pitch to Britain at the moment. We all know, you and me, why, for the moment, the United Kingdom has to remain within the EU Customs Union until the day, if this day ever comes, that you can have free trade, open trade, between UK and the EU, while UK will be outside the customs union, if that comes one day, because you have this problem of the, okay. of the Irish border. All right. Now, if we were out, if we went to WTO rules, so if we you know, crashed out, we went to WTO rules, how bad would that be for Britain? Well, you know, trade regimes are like football leagues. You have the first division, the second division, the third division, and the fourth division. Mm. Okay, the well, first what division, division would that is be? the internal market. Yeah. Exit. That would be, you would move from division one to division four. So that's not great, is it? No, not great. Uh, two is worse than one, uh, three is worse than two, and mm. four is worse than three. Well, but I, I, that's what the WTO regime is. The WTO regime is the common denominator between uh, Bangladesh and Canada. Okay, now just one other one. It took Canada seven years to cobble together a trade deal with the EU. And at the very last moment, there was a hurdle because the region of Wallonia in Belgium voted against it. How many years do you think it would take Britain to cobble together a trade deal with the EU? My guess is it would take roughly four to five years uh, because on the one side, UK is much bigger than Canada, which is why it should be more complex. But on yeah. the other side, we start from a situation which is very different. We start from a situation where there is total free trade uh, between the United Kingdom and the continent. And the yeah. question would be, how do we have less free trade than what we have? And not the problem we had to solve with Canada, which is how can we have more free trade than one we have? Well, John, we're in the territory now of different people reading the same text and coming to completely contradictory positions. You have a number of Tory MPs and the SNP, by the way, saying this is a sellout, a betrayal of the fishing industry. And then other Tory MPs and the Prime Minister saying we become an independent coastal state and there is no trade-off of fishing quotas for market access. Then throw in the EU negotiators. That's not what they seem to think they're getting if you believe a tweet from the deputy chief negotiator this afternoon. So very little consensus across the board. But as you say, one man with many red lines on fishing is the Scottish Secretary, David Mundell. I've been asking him about them. And first of all, he told me why he thinks this Brexit deal is the best practical option. The deal that, that's on offer is, is what's available compared to what the alternatives are. And the alternatives are a potential no deal crashing out of the EU in four months uh, time or uh, going into the uncertainty, division, possibly chaos around uh, having another EU referendum or a general election which nobody uh, wants. You set out your red lines. What did you think you were going to do if they weren't met? I, I set out three uh, positions, in fact. One in relation to ensuring uh, that, uh, the, the, that we didn't see uh, a customs border down the Irish Sea. And fishing, which is a hugely important issue in Scotland, but also warning of the danger of no deal. What I have to do is to make uh, a judgment on what, uh, in relation to the most important of my red lines, is the integrity of the United Kingdom. Your red line said we cannot remain in the common fisheries policy beyond December 2020. The deal allows for exactly that. The deal allows for us to become an independent coastal state. But I'm absolutely clear, that is my position. We leave the common fisheries policy in December 2020. But the deal doesn't say that. The deal says the transition period is extended, we remain in the common fisheries, 
policy beyond December 2020, if that was a red line for you, you should have resigned. I am very clear that I would not support the extension of the transition period if we have not left the common fisheries policy. You said that you can't support a deal if it provides for a new agreement on access and quota shares. This deal provides for a new agreement on access and quota shares. I said that I could not support a deal that provided a predetermined agreement. This agreement allows us to negotiate access and quota shares. What you actually said was that you wouldn't support a deal that had any pre-existing arrangement in force. What is this if not a pre-existing arrangement? A deal, surely by definition, is an arrangement, is it not? What uh, my uh, words, I think anybody looking objectively at C mean, is that we would not have set out what the quota arrangements and what the access arrangements were going to be with the EU ahead of leaving the EU. Some of your colleagues strongly disagree with you, Conservative MPs, they're saying this is a betrayal of Brexit. I just don't agree with that.